What I have to say here is based partly on a book that really I, I really enjoyed reading, I thoroughly recommend it to you, and that's Walcott's book, um, Writing Up Qualitative Rational Analysis. I just, it, two good things about that. It's very well written, as you might expect in a book about writing. Mm-hmm. And secondly, it's very thin, so you can read it you know, in an evening. It's the kind of thing you can read a couple of hours. It's, it's, it's well written and, and, and short. So I, I borrowed the ideas from that here. He talks about getting started. We all have that problem. I have this problem at the moment. I've got, I've just, actually one thing that got me into action recently, I, I read an email that some, somebody that said, that chapter you said you write for us is going to be done by the end, by the beginning of June. I thought, oh God, it's, what is it, the 12th of May? <laughs> I've, got, I've got three weeks to write it. So I've, got, I've got various bits of notes lying around, but I've got, now I've got three weeks to write 4,000 words for this chapter of the book. I'm writing. Um, so there we are. <laughs> That, that gets you going, but always there's something else to do. The, the, you know, doing the ironing is a typical thing. Yeah, is this? You don't have this problem. What? <laughs> That's that wave of the hand. Sorry, yeah. as if you know, I, I don't. You're writing like a maniac, aren't you? <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> but um, some of us have the problem then. Okay, not everybody. Some of us have a problem. That's, uh, I find, I, actually I must admit, I don't find the ironing, I mean I don't do a lot of ironing these days, but I always find something else. The garden is something I can, I can, that needs doing. There's always a constant problem of keeping up with the garden. Ways to get around that, having things like, like you know, a plan or a purpose and a sequence and an outline and so on. I certainly find a plan helps me. I always write a plan what I'm writing. It's often just one sheet of A4, but I plan it out. And I often do more than one. I rewrite them every now and again, have new ones to reflect new ideas. But that gets me going. It's a starting point. I feel I've started now. I can write that bit and so on. Um, but, of course, always the problem in qualitative analysis of data is, is how to get rid of data. You've got far too much, so you need to, to, to narrow it down and, and squeeze it out and, and simplify it. Okay, how do you start writing? Well, here's a couple of methods. Um, start writing as soon as you can. Write whenever you can. Write before you do the data collection, even. And it's not a bad idea, actually, to sit down, and even before you've started interviewing people, to, to start writing at that stage and jot down some notes about what you might expect to find and so on, um, or what you think are the, the major issues and so on. So don't wait until you've got data to, to analyse before you start writing. Um, Remember this point, writing is thinking. Don't think you've got to think first and then write. Um, actually getting things on paper is doing the thinking. I think that for me, when I do these kind of plans and outlines, that's what I'm doing. It's, it's kind of figuring out the thinking. And the important thing is to get from that plan to a longer narrative as quickly as you can. Because if you leave that plan around, as I have sometimes done, lying on my desk for a week or two, when you come back to it, it doesn't make any sense. That plan is the reflection of how you're thinking. You need to get it into writing, because otherwise it just goes. It's, it's not, not very clear at all. I don't okay. know if you've had that experience. but uh. Yeah, I was just reading just a little, little section of someone else's thesis, because I certainly didn't have time to read it, but it was about the creative cycle, which is where I would put writing as a creative mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. And she's created, the woman, very high profile, created a new cycle, but very basically what it says is you go into creativity you think you're going and you're writing and you're writing and then you will inevitably go into disillusionment and despair which is what <laughs> I was kind of feeling and yes, then last yes, night I had yeah. this moment and it suddenly in a very very and it was actually half an hour I wrote a very comprehensive bit and she says and you will suddenly it will come to the point just as when you wrote the plan so that it, it's just cyclical all the time you know mm. but that disillusionment mm. and despair oh, yes, you know, yes. you trust yeah. the process go with it and then you'll be out of yeah. it yeah. it really yes. helped and the writing is thinking, that's what she was saying, the doing, do, just keep doing. Yeah, yes. I think a point I make on a later slide is, someone's, again, probably is what Walcott's um, suggestion, that the, the important thing here is not to do good writing all the time. Yeah. The important thing is to write all the time, yeah. even if it's not good. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. Yeah. Um, and the, here's two, two methods you can use. I've tried both of these, and I'm, I must admit I'm a bleeder. Um, that's what Walcott calls them. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, but I've tried free writing. I don't know if you've tried this, just, just sitting down and writing things. Maybe that's the way you do things, but I can't do it that way. I, I, I'm a careful writer. The point is, when I'm, doing, when I'm writing, my sentences always come out perfectly grammatical first time round. 
but it takes me a long time to do. I'm a quite slow writer in comparison. I don't, I don't write fast. Um, but I do worry over every point I'm making. I think through, yes, I've got to say that. I've got to, in my head, I'm saying I've got three points to make here and I've got to do that and, got, and so on. So it comes in that very careful kind of way. Whereas a free writer, just, it just comes out. And then, then you think, look back at it and think, God, how could I write that? that that's wrong. That's, let's change that. Oh, well, that's a good idea. I'll keep that and so on. Where to begin writing? Um, it doesn't matter where you begin. Start anywhere. Which chapter you begin with, doesn't matter. Start any chapter, as long as you get something done. Um, one, one common way is to start with the methods, because that's what you've been doing. That's what you've been thinking about early on in the work. You know, how did I choose my sample and which people and how did I design my you know, interview schedule and so on? So start with that. It's easy. It's, it's descriptive. It's doing things. And, you, and, and, of course, using lots of standard text that you can refer to as well. So it's a, an easy way in. It doesn't matter. You don't have to start with the hardest bit first. Start with the easy bits first. You'll feel so much better if you've got three easy chapters done rather than one very hard chapter, only half done. Um, so, so do that. And this is about the methods thing, you know, give readers enough information about how you did it to, so that they can challenge your version. And the idea should be that you've told them how you did it so they can come back and say, are you sure you, does that work? And so on. Yes, of course it worked because you've done it. Organisation of, of the, your work, and there are various ways of doing this, and I've suggested some here. Um, chronological, case by case, thematic are, are very common ones. So in other words, you could tell a, a chronological story, this happened, then that, then that, and so on. And that might be appropriate for the case you're looking at, and so on. A more common one, though, actually, is case by case. So you have different cases you look at and compare the cases. They might even be I hesitate to, say, hesitate to say ideal types. In other words, in some way, typifications or typical kind of cases that you've brought up. And you compare that with that with that. And then the comparisons can bring out some of the issues that you're, you're, you're dealing with. Or the alternative is this kind of grounded theory or, or thematic coding approach or template analysis approach. You, you start with themes. You know, your analysis has thrown up these basic themes and you then talk about each theme. There might be a chapter on a theme or a category that you talk about. And those can be in vivo or emic notions as well as your ideas as well. So thematic can be based on theory um, as well. Um, so it can be you know, things that you've got out of, of you know, the, the respondents' words, or it can be a theoretical idea as you've imposed upon the work or discovered in the work. Um, then there's issues about how the narrative goes, and, and you can combine these in various ways. So you, you, you can have a thematic approach that makes reference to cases, for example, or you can bring in chronological issues into your cases, so each case could be done chronologically. And you can begin to tell a kind of a narrative or you know, look at kind of almost a life history kind of approach of individuals, if that's relevant to your work. Um, try to keep separate if you can analysis and description but it's not always possible to do that um, it's something it's quite you can qualitative work quite hard to keep those separate but at least be aware of those two things um, if you're stuck then start with these right one of those two um, the person this study is to so and so um, actually it's amazing how, how many times you can write that during the process of writing a, a thesis or a book or an article or whatever um, and every time you write it you update your ideas so you, you rewrite it with the latest version. Um, getting a focus. I talked about this a bit in Grounded Theory, uh, where you kind of focus in on certain kind of categories or themes as, as, as being central. But other ways of doing that are um, talking to colleagues. One thing that I've found over the years is that if you can tell your mates what you're doing in a few sentences you must have a clear idea of what you're doing. Um, you know, and actually forcing yourself to do it, to talk to somebody who is not an expert and explain what you found that's important is actually very, very good. Um, or maybe not. Actually, I remember doing that recently with a friend of mine who's an engineer by background. Um, and I remember saying to him, I got this idea about doing so-and-so. And he came back with a single question. Of, yes, that's true, but why so-and-so? And I thought, that's such an obvious question. Why didn't I think of that? And I gave up at that point. The whole idea was kind of so rusty and, and insecure and so on. So just simply rehearsing it with, if you like, a, 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 an intelligent audience was good enough to, to begin to critique what I was doing. 
Of course, you can try free writing uh, as a way of developing that focus and see what you're trying to do. Um, go back and um, oh, so see it's problem setting, not problem solving. So your writing is about setting problems rather than you're not trying to close things down and give the final answer to things. You're trying to raise issues. And actually, that's much easier to write by raising issues than it is by actually giving the final explanation. Keep the research question under constant scrutiny. And be aware, I think I've said this in various other places, be aware of audience and the different ways in which you can write. Um, at some point, you'll need to worry about, are you writing for a journal? Are you writing for a newspaper? Are you writing a, an evaluation report and so on? These are different things. Writing is hard, and it's hard to keep going, but you need to keep going. Um, it, these are from, um, this is from Walcott's book, this particular little story here. Um, he talks about a Chinese acquaintance he was once with, um, and they were eating some food, and he was trying to use chopsticks. And he said to his Chinese mate, he said, am I using the chopsticks the right way? And his Chinese friend said back to him, is the food reaching your mouth? <laughs> and if you think about that, the writing's the same. Is this writing good? Well, is it doing the job? Is it conveying my ideas? Is it persuading my audience? And so on. That's, in the end, that's what matters. And even nicer is this, this thing from Hal Becker. By the way, Hal Becker's got a, a nice book on writing as well. Um, I think it's called Ro Writing for Social Scientists, his book. Um, and it's the result of a course he ran, a bit like the master's course here. He, he ran a similar master's course for PhD students. And the bit about you know, when you talk to them about how to write and so on, he, he wrote up into his book. And he says this very wise thing here. The only version that counts is the final version. The previous versions can be absolute rubbish. It doesn't matter. So don't get depressed if it's not right to begin with. It's the final version that goes out to the examiner or to the publisher that matters. And even then, you know, um, it, things can change. So you might have the final draft you give to your supervisor who comes back with comments to say, change that and change that. And you can still improve on it. In fact, even after the Viva, you can change things. <laughs> it might not be quite right at that point. <clears throat> oh, this is the point I made about staying with it. Elbow makes this point. A precondition for writing well is being able to write badly and to write when you're not in the mood. I think it's such a wise thing to say that, you know, you don't have to be in the mood to write, just write. You know? um, people say, I haven't written, anything, haven't written anything today. I wasn't inspired. Um, the, the serious professional writer never says that. They just write. Um, and that's it. Do a few hours writing every day. In fact, I've, found many, I've been, talked to many colleagues and, and, and outlier academics about this, and I find, generally speaking, academics write by writing a few hours every day. Um, I remember um, Paul Atkinson, it was. Yes, Paul Atkinson, who's a professor of sociology in, in Wales, um, in one of his books, saying that he writes every night from six till eight. He comes home from work, or at least he used to before he retired, um, come home from work and then sat down at the desk for a couple of hours and wrote something every night. And you can see how, if you do that, you know, six nights a week, presumably he took one day off, he didn't write every night, but, but you know, six days a week, that's, that's 12 hours a week writing. I mean, you know, you can get it in, you can write what? If you're doing it well, you can write perhaps a thousand words in an hour, let's say 500. So that's 6,000 words a week. That soon gets a thesis done when you're writing at that kind of pace. So you can see a little bit every day is, is perhaps the, the way to do it. Staying with it. Here's one I like. I, I follow this approach, the drop file approach. This is from Walcott as well. Um, the idea behind this is you don't have to write things. You can jot down things and keep them together. You can do all of this electronically. You can have folders. You can have a, a you know, single word file with bits in it and so on. I tend to do the old-fashioned thing and have bits of paper because I, I take notes on, in books on bits, scraps of paper and on the computer as well. And so they're all over the place. But, so I, I keep them together and I kind of organise them in that fashion. And then I can come back to them. I can write things and rewrite things and so on. And the idea is you can work on things without actually completing them, without feeling you're starting from nothing at all. You've got something when you start looking at it. And you can do things in a, in a kind of almost random fashion. You don't have to write one chapter and then the other. I just write whenever I th the idea comes to mind or whenever, you know, I'll sit down and write something out or when the panic comes up, like when I read that email yesterday about having to do things by the end of this month, I suddenly write out, I think, oh, bloody hell, I've been thinking about that and wrote out a page of notes on it, on a scrap of paper. So I, I, I do have, and I have photocopies and things like that and other bits and bobs that will all go into the same file. So it's a way of organising. 
I mean, I have, you know, I call it a research, actually it's not a research diary, it's, it's several different volumes of research diaries, different colours and different ages and different dog-earednesses and so on. But I, I, have, I like hardback kind of little booklets which I write in with a fountain pen as well. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I keep wow. notes in those. And at some stage I have to retype them. And you have to say, that's the bit that goes there. And then I retype it and maybe change the wording as well as I do so and expand it. And then it becomes a file on the computer that I can use or, or a bit of the chapter like you're saying with a heading and someone attached to it. It's amazing to me how, how much you can get into a, a kind of whole new kind of reality almost when you're writing. I mean, I've actually described this. Some people are almost like a virtual reality where you're inside the computer somehow with the words you're constructing and so on. But I remember also saying to somebody after I wrote my first book, and I was spending perhaps three or four days on my own at home just writing and writing and writing, that at the end of the, those three days I was absolutely exhausted. And it, not because it was hard work. I mean, I was just sitting at this. It wasn't, wasn't hard work at all. I, I was exhausted because it felt like I was talking to somebody for three days, <laughs> having a conversation with somebody for three days. That's what it felt like. I was, you know, constant, like I am now, talking. It's like talking to you for three days on end. You would be exhausted after three days of that. And writing is a bit like that. You're communicating with the reader somehow. And, uh, it can be like that. Okay, so that's, that's one of my favourites. Get, get the details right first time. Um, references and citations, you know. Um, yeah, don't just put in a rough old reference that you've got to come back to in a year's time and try and track down, because um, you'll find it very hard to do that. Um, use style sheet, keep to you know, consistent acronyms, spellings and so on in what you're doing. Try and get that sorted out. Use page numbers if you can. It's very easy to switch that on in word processor to, to, to use those. References. Most readers will not consult your sources. They count on you to inform them. This is one reason for being accurate and complete. Conversely, some readers will consult your citations. That is another reason. Oh, there's a spelling of Walcott, by the way. <laughs> one, one O. <laughs> Sorry, there it is. Page 43. Um, so there is a justification for referencing. Okay? Um, most don't care, um, but they, they rely on you to say that it was that, that book that it came from. But one or two of them will want to check it up. They'll be so inspired by you, they want to get the book and find it. Um, and that's why it needs to be accurate. Uh, so. What's been amazing to me is the number of inaccuracies. When I've been chasing what people have... And I've been like, that mm. isn't... Mm. They've even miswritten title. Usually they are titles. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. And someone has even quoted it as being in a different journal. Yesterday, when I was searching, a, it was an American law journal, and it had been... Uh, published in paediatricians, something or other. It was like totally different. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, what happens is people get, get um, lazy and, and don't check things properly. And, of course, if you're doing this day in, day out, that, that can happen. I mean, but these are published articles that I'm chasing their references. Oh, I know, I know. It, 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 it gets through the system somehow. I, I always remember um, I, I got caught on this because um, this is back to the Oak University Press book I wrote. Uh, they had a very good editor, sub-editor, working on it, who checked all my references. And there was one reference on there. It was a book on philosophy I'd referred to. And I thought I knew, because I, I studied philosophy years ago, I, I thought I knew what it was. I just wrote it down. And I said, so and so. And he came back and he checked it for me. And he said, that publisher wasn't operating then, so it couldn't have published the book in that year. Can you check it for me? Mm-hmm. And at that stage, I thought, oh, bloody hell. And then I spent hours looking. I didn't know where it was on the shelf. You know, I, I couldn't find it. And then I did find it. I eventually had to come to the library here and look for it. When I found it, all I could find was the hardback version, which is not the version I had. And indeed, it was, it was right. I got the, the year wrong on it, so I had to change the year. But, uh, so I, I guessed it, because I thought I knew it so well, I just guessed it, and I was wrong. So it, I got caught out like that. But I, too, have had the same experience as you. I remember a couple of years ago, I found an article, a reference, rather, to an article... Remember, I talked about Fielding and Fielding earlier on. One of the authors was Nigel Fielding. He's written a lot of stuff on, on computer-assisted quantitative analysis software. And he's written a lot of stuff with a, a guy called Ray Lee, who was a professor at Royal Holloway. He's just retired, actually. So it was Fielding and Lee. But I found this article. It was by Fielding, Fielding and Ray. And I then worked out what it was, of course. The person who'd written down got Ray Lee and got Ray as the, their, their surname rather than Lee. And you can see how if you're not familiar with that person, which is the surname and which is the first name? Lee, Ray? Hmm, yeah. <laughs> Could be either. And they chose the wrong one. Uh, and that got published. Nobody picked that up. The, none of the, 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 um, the journal. Uh, yeah. 
uh, Edith just picked it up. Over the years, you'll find many more. Yes, we're, we're not, none of us is perfect. These things happen. Um, but they shouldn't be happening, but they do. So. Get feedback. Ask your mates. Like I've said, I talk to my friends about <laughs> ideas and, and get feedback from them. Um, but in particular, get them to read what you've written. If they're good friends, that is. <laughs> if they're nice friends. <laughs> if they'll read things. Um, and obviously, it's best if you can ask people who know something about the area, whose judgment you trust and so on. Um, mums are good at proofreading, but mums are not good at content reading. And that's, that was my experience. I mean, my mum used to check my spelling and stuff like that, but she would, she would say, I have no idea what you're talking about here. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but other friends are better at doing that. But it helps um, if you tell them what you want from them. What kind of feedback do you want? Because otherwise I'll give the wrong, wrong right, advice. So Sorry? When I've asked people to check my work, sometimes I actually find it better to get somebody who doesn't know the area. Because that means you exploit that. Depends what you want them to do. Yes. Okay. If you want them to act as a kind of semi-naive reader, who, who, yeah. you know, so have you expressed no, yourself yeah, clearly and so on. Is it properly? Because if a person who doesn't know very much in the area yeah. and understands it, then I've always took that to mean my descriptive. I've got enough research into it to make it self, you know. Make it clear. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, 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 yeah, yes. And yeah. then pass it by somebody who knows the area. If that's what you want to find out, have I written it well enough to explain my ideas clearly? Yeah, that's, right. that's what you'll get from that. But if, you want, if what you want to know is, have I given a, a reasonable summary of Silverman's description well, of his I mean, work on so-and-so? Yeah. You need an expert yeah. to look at that. But that so. I'm trying to get one of these, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, give, you know, tell people what you need them to do. And in particular, if there are things you're not sure about, ask them to focus in on that. So rather than... I mean, I've, I've certainly had this once or twice, and I think I got involved in this once. I, I, went, I was given something to read, and I went through with a red pen, corrected every single typo, and they came after, you know, I spent hours of work doing this, and they came out, I didn't, I didn't want the typos. I mean, uh, it's only a first draft. Oh, God, I <laughs> wasted my time. So what I wanted was feedback on this. What did you think about this idea? If they had told me that from the beginning, I wouldn't have worried with my red pen. I'd just read it very quickly and, and give them some feedback. So that's why it helps to, to know what to do. Tightening up, yes, of course, you have to rewrite things. Um, that's one thing which undergraduates are very bad at. I mean, certainly, my experience is undergraduates write essays once. That's it. Um, a few notes, perhaps, and then out, out the essay comes. When you get to postgraduate level and beyond, you'll be used to writing many, many copies of things. Um, I mean, typically, I mean, I, I keep folders with previous copies. I never throw anything away on my computer, I have folders with previous copies, and I can go up to version 12 on things easily. So, yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's round things off there and say, look, um, there, are, uh, there are several different more sheets to look at um, about reviewing what you've done, um, rewriting things. I mean, don't forget, you know, when you're editing, I'm sure you've been through all this, is things me and already know anyway about you know, how to, to edit and how to tighten up the text. Whether you need conclusions or not, so you don't always need lengthy conclusions. People tend to labour conclusions, and sometimes they can be yeah, quite short. Um, the conclusion is probably one of the sections I've probably put the most detail in. Yeah, but it can be quite short, actually. Um, it doesn't have to be lengthy things. And that, yeah. You're smiling. Have you done this or something? Yeah. I don't know. Yours are long? 10 or 5% of the word count. All oh, right. I suspect you're repeating yourself a lot. You're just simply summarising things you've said already. And you probably don't need to do that so much. Save yourself time, you know, just... So what, what yeah. overall percentage should the conclusion be? There's, there's no simple answer to that question. It depends on the kind of work you're doing and, you know, how you've expressed yourself and whether you do need to spend time and so on in the concluding section or not. Um, I can't say that. Yeah. It depends what you put in the conclusions. But, but you can very often get away with quite short conclusions. Yeah. You know, if you look at published papers, even published books, <clears throat> you'll find, but published papers, you might find just a paragraph for a conclusion. You know, maybe a lengthy paragraph, maybe a third of a page. Yeah. But that's not a lot in the context of a 5,000 word paper. Yeah. <clears throat> um, or in a book, you know, a concluding chapter can be just a few pages. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be a very lengthy thing. Um, 
And if you, if you do write a long thing, it's worth going back and thinking, you know, have I simply summarised what's gone on in previous chapters? In which case, either move the summary to the chapter where it should be, at the end of that chapter, summarise it at that point and, and leave it there. Or perhaps you've already got that in the chapter, in which case you don't need to re-summarise it. And what you need to do is express other things that, you know, that your conclusion is doing. Um, do I say on that? Cutting things out? Oh, yes. The first book I wrote um, was too long by 20,000 words. So I had to cut out 20,000 words. <laughs> I think I wrote... I Sorry? I think that made me cry, cutting out that amount of... Well, I managed it because I had to. They said we won't publish it. No, we can't, can't publish it at that level. But, um, but I, what I did was I kept it. Um, I, 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 I did things by cutting out whole sections. You can't go through and edit. It takes too long. Yeah. So I cut out whole sections. I had to say to myself, what's really important here, what's not? And do you know what? Nobody noticed that there were things missing. I mean, it was important to me when I wrote it, but none of the readers ever said, I wish you'd wrote in a section on so-and-so, because right. they never spotted it was missing. Yeah. So, you know, that, in the end, it worked okay. Um, and what I did with one or two things, got, I found them out of websites, things like this. I mean, one of the things about this book was it had a, a link to websites, so I put stuff that I cut onto the website. And, in fact, used it later on in other things. <laughs> you know, it didn't get lost. You know. but, uh, the thinking was useful. <laughs>